Throughout the various wars waged between the Global Defense Initiative and the Brotherhood of Nod over the resource that is Tiberium, both factions made use of a variety of unique and powerful weapon systems. From attack bikes and flame tanks, to Orca aircraft and particle beam cannons. One vehicle in particular continues to stand out above the rest. One that has been in GDI's arsenal since the First Tiberium War, and whose legacy extends far beyond that war. This iconic vehicle was the Mammoth Tank. While the Mammoth tank's reputation is almost irrevocably tied to that of the Global Defense Initiative, its true origins actually date back to the Second World War. When Stalin rose to power in the 1920s, he set about industrializing the Soviet Union and spreading the ideals of communism across the globe. Stalin thought that the destiny of his Soviet empire was to span all of continental Europe, and, to that end, he began to build up his military forces. As Stalin amassed man and material for war, the nations of Western Europe banded together to form a military junta, led by German General Gunther von Essling, to resist any Western expansion by the Soviet Union. No one knows the exact date the war between the Allies and Soviet Union started, but it seems to have begun sometime in the early 1950s, lasting until the mid to late 1950s. With an enlistment exceeding 14 million, the Soviet Union preferred to use brute force when going up against Allied forces on the battlefields of Europe. Thanks to their industrial output, the Soviet Union could field a great number of heavy tanks. While slower compared to the light and medium tanks of the Allies, the Soviet heavy tanks had double the firepower in the form of twin 105mm cannons. The greatest weakness of these tanks, however, was their vulnerability to aircraft, especially the Allies' Apache longbow attack helicopters. Aware of these weaknesses, Soviet commanders requested the construction of a tank that not only had anti-air capabilities, but that could also self-repair. Soviet scientists and engineers created what came to be known as the first Mammoth Tank. Now, I don't believe that Mammoth Tank was this vehicle's official name. I think the word Mammoth acts more as a nickname, possibly given to it by the Soviets. Or perhaps that's the nickname Allied troops gave it after their first encounter with it. The tank being so huge that it reminded them of the prehistoric mammoth, one of the largest land animals to ever live. The Soviet mammoth tank was indeed a formidable opponent on the battlefield. In a one-on-one -on -one engagement with any other tank, it could easily defeat its opposition due to the sheer firepower of its twin 120mm cannons and missiles. The cannons would not fire at the same time. Instead, the crews used a staggered method, firing the second round shortly after the first. Like a 1-2 punch, the first round weakened the armor of the enemy tank, and the second round finished it off. The 12 missiles, 6 equipped on each side of the tank's turret, were quite deadly against infantry, and even capable of shooting down aircraft, especially helicopters, thanks to their limited heat-seeking capabilities. Of course, all armaments of the Mammoth were just as effective at bringing enemy structures crumbling to the ground as they were at turning allied vehicles into scrap. In addition to its firepower, the Mammoth was heavily armored, able to take a lot of punishment from enemy weapons before being totally destroyed. Its crews were equipped with tools that allowed them to perform repairs right on the front lines and in the middle of battle. They could only repair so much of the vehicle, though. To repair more extensive damage, the tank had to be taken to a service depot. While certainly the most powerful ground vehicle in the Soviet arsenal, it did have its own share of weaknesses, the primary one being speed. It was slower than the standard heavy tank in both movement and reload speed. The tank was also very expensive to build and maintain, especially with the cost of training a crew to effectively operate it. While the Allies didn't have any heavy tanks of their own, they did have a lot of light and medium tanks, which could overwhelm a couple of mammoths. Later in the war, the Allies developed the Chronosphere and Chrono Tanks. The Chronosphere and its tank variant allowed the Allies to position their vehicles behind the mammoth in order to attack its backside, where the armor is weakest. 
In the late stages of the war, the Soviets instructed one Dr. Dmitri to create a new Soviet super tank. While working on this tank, Dmitri made contact with the Allies with his intentions to defect. The Allies came up with a plan to extract Dmitri from a facility in Poland, where these new tanks were being tested. General Carville appointed an unnamed Allied commander to conduct the mission. We've got hot spots everywhere, Colonel. This is Poland. I've got super tanks on my tail, mad tanks. I've got nukes pointed at London. And in the middle of all this, I've got a Soviet research scientist that I've got to evac. And then there's the little matter of running the Soviet army out of Poland. I hope you took care of business before you got in the car, Colonel. Because, son, you're in for one hell of a ride. The mission was supposed to be a simple extraction. However, things quickly went wrong, as the super tank suddenly went out of control and began attacking everything in sight. These mammoths really were super tanks, able to take an immense amount of damage before being destroyed. They were even resistant to a nuclear blast detonated from a demolition truck. The tanks even seemed to be equipped with their own personal Iron Curtain device, making them truly invulnerable to all damage for a short time. In addition, they were equipped with a coaxial machine gun, used to kill enemy infantry. More disturbing, though, was that the tanks had no crew to control them, operated purely by some kind of artificial intelligence program. When the Allied commander arrived in the field, he first had to get his small force across a river and over to the nearby base to repair it. Once this was done, he sent a spy to infiltrate the Soviet radar dome to the northeast of his base. Here, the spy was able to reprogram the tanks, turning them completely against their creators. The super tanks ceased their assaults on civilian villages and the Allied base, and headed straight for the large Soviet base in the south. The tanks leveled the entire southern base, destroying themselves in the process. Afterwards, the way was clear for Allied forces to find and rescue Dr. Dmitri in a village close to the now destroyed Soviet base. A helicopter was brought in and extracted the doctor from the area. No other heavily modified versions of the Mammoth tank were seen for the rest of the war. With their advanced technology, the Allies ultimately defeated the Soviet Union, crushing Stalin's dreams of a continental Soviet empire and bringing the Second World War to an end. From here, the Soviet Union would be dissolved as the Allied nations spent the next few decades rebuilding from the war. At least, that's what happens in one timeline. In an alternative timeline, the Allies still defeat the Soviet Union, but don't dissolve it. Instead, they put one Alexei Romanov in charge of the Union, thinking that he would keep the peace with the Allied powers. But Romanov had other plans. He would go on to rebuild the Soviet military, and launch a surprise attack against the United States. The successor of the Soviet mammoth tank during this Third World War was called the Apocalypse Tank, but I won't be focusing on that one for this video. I will also note that not everyone accepts the Allies ending from Red Alert 1 as canon, in regards to how it relates to the Tiberium timeline, but it is the ending framework that I'll be working from for the rest of the video. The arrival of Tiberium set in motion a chain of events that would lead to the outbreak of the First Tiberium War in the early 21st century, a war which saw two factions vying for power on the world stage. The first being the Brotherhood of Nod, and the second being the Global Defense Initiative. GDI preferred to use brute force and overwhelming firepower to combat the Brotherhood, and the Mammoth Tank was the best vehicle to accommodate this doctrine. But where did GDI acquire these new Mammoth Tanks? And why were they so similar to the original ones used during the Second World War? Taking a step outside the lore for a minute, it's common for a game developer to reuse assets across multiple games in order to save time on development. So it is certainly possible that this was the case for Westwood when they were making Red Alert 1, and the Mammoth Tank was definitely not the only reused asset in that game. Maybe the Soviet Mammoth was supposed to have a different design compared to the GDI Mammoth, but due to time constraints, the same model we see in the in-game cutscenes was used for both. Stepping back into the lore, the Global Defense Initiative is supported by the United Nations, and in particular, the UN Security Council, a council that had Russia as a permanent member. It's important to note that we don't know what kind of system of government Russia had in the Tiberium timeline after the events of Red Alert, 
but I think it's safe to assume that it was largely aligned with the values and goals of the Western European countries that made up the Allied powers during the Second World War. This could mean that Russia's contribution to GDI under the United Nations Global Defense Act was the commitment of military weapons and equipment, and one of these weapon systems could have been the Mammoth Tank, leaving us to question whether Russia manufactured new tanks from the original Soviet design, or did they have a bunch of tanks left in storage after the Second World War that they upgraded with modern equipment. Personally, I imagine many of the tanks would have been scrapped and the scrap material used to rebuild infrastructure after the war. So to me, it's more likely that they built new ones, or handed the designs over to GDI to manufacture on their own. Alternatively, the new Mammoth could have been constructed by GDI from designs and surviving models that were confiscated by the Allies during and after the Second World War. Remember our Russian defector, Dr. Dmitry, who helped build the Mammoth tanks that went haywire in Poland? Dmitry could have given the Allies plenty of information on the tanks in exchange for his defection. It's possible that this information was uncovered and used to build the new Mammoth, officially called the X-66 Mammoth, or Mammoth Mark I. In detail, the Mark I Mammoth kept the quad treads from the original. This enabled the tank to better handle changes in terrain elevation. The engine was located at the back of the Mammoth. I couldn't find any information on what kind of engine the tank used, but my initial assumption was that it would be some kind of large gas turbine engine. Some sources claim that it uses an atomic generator, but all of them are third-party sources, none of which seem to link back to a reliable first-party source. Like most tanks, this was the most vulnerable part of the vehicle, as it had the least amount of armor. The Mark I also kept the dual 120mm guns as its main weapons, capable of firing armor-piercing discarding Sabo, or APDS rounds, a round that's used for anti-armor warfare. Just like its Soviet predecessor, it did not typically fire both cannons at the same time, instead having a short delay between each shot. The tank was again armed with a total of 12 missiles. Two pods of six missiles were attached to each side of the tank's turret. Each pod was loaded with Mammoth Tusk missiles that were primarily used to protect against aircraft, especially attack helicopters. Still, these missiles were effective against other ground vehicles, base buildings, and infantry. Some Mammoth tanks also kept what I'm going to assume is an optic periscope on top of the turret, which also acts as the main hatch to enter and exit the vehicle. This allowed the tank commander to see and acquire targets, and probably switch between various imaging modes such as night vision and infrared. Not all Mammoth tanks had this device. Some just had a standard hatch on top of the turret, with the optics located elsewhere. Another hatch is located at the front of the tank. This is where the driver sits. The optic on top allows him to see where to go. Two lights are also located here at the front, with two tow hooks below the lights. Additional features include metal racks on each side of the turret to hold extra supplies and equipment, two radio antennas on the top back portion of the turret, handrails for crew to climb on the tank, and finally, a couple of lights on the back to signal when the vehicle was stopped or backing up. As for operational crew, I'll give my best guess. There would certainly be one driver to, well, drive the tank, and one commander to coordinate and lead the crew. There would be one gunner for each of the two main guns. Unless the Mammoth Mark I uses some kind of automated loading system, it would need two human gun loaders as well. I also think there would need to be at least one person to operate the missile launchers, though these could also be automated. The question then is, who repairs the tank when it's on the front lines? My default assumption is that it would certainly be the tank crew themselves, when they're not actively engaged in combat. The Mammoth could have an engineer inside, whose sole role was to repair any damage it sustained, but I'm not sure there would be any room for him, as the tank already has six or seven crew members in addition to the space needed to store the ammo. So regardless of the size of the Mammoth, the number of crew needed to properly operate the vehicle would make for some very cramped working conditions. Research and production of the Mammoth Mark I occurred in both Europe and Africa. The base in Africa was established in the country of Tanzania. This was so that when the tanks were built, GDI could immediately send them to the front lines in an attempt to stop the Brotherhood's takeover of the continent. K-1 
Kane found out about this base and ordered a Nod commander to take a small task force to infiltrate and destroy the base. This bloody juggernaut is GDI's newest weapon. They haven't started production yet, and they won't if you continue to meet expectations and maintain your performance. You will lead Brotherhood snipers onto the GDI base, find the weapons factory, and destroy this beast in its nest. Take no prisoners, and make no excuses. This must be done. This small force was made up of rocket soldiers, an artillery tank, an engineer, and most importantly, a commando. The commando scouted ahead of the force, taking out any GDI infantry he encountered. The force made contact with a mammoth tank that was on patrol, and quickly took it out. The force eventually located the GDI base, and discovered three more uncrewed mammoths surrounded by a fence. Ultimately, the Nod force leveled the entire base, and destroyed the three mammoth tanks. While this was a successful mission for the Brotherhood, it did not prevent GDI from continuing to produce more mammoths as Kane had hoped. While the Brotherhood would go on to complete their takeover of Africa, they lost a lot of ground in Europe, as GDI received an influx in funding from the UN after they had been proven innocent in the Bialystok incident. This allowed GDI to bolster their forces with new weapon systems like the Mammoth Tank and Orca Assault Craft, which helped them to drive back and ultimately defeat the Brotherhood of Nod at Sarajevo. In the aftermath of the First Tiberium War, GDI became the premier economic and military superpower on the planet. This status gained GDI an increased military budget, which allowed them to develop even more advanced weapon systems. In particular, GDI emphasized the development of mechanical walkers. The first was the Wolverine, followed by the Titan Mark I. GDI created an even larger, more powerful, four-legged walker, the Mammoth Mark II. Armed with two railguns as its primary weapons, the Mark II walker could easily destroy a standard Mark I tank. GDI had already begun phasing out the Mark I's from their arsenal, well before the first Mark II's began walking off the assembly lines. The Mark I's they did keep were primarily used as targets for weapons testing and training. Even the Brotherhood of Nod used the Mark I's as test targets for their new Banshee aircraft, which saw action during the Second Tiberium War. Not all Mark I's were doomed to be nothing more than target practice. Some were still used in combat. In particular, Three Mark I mammoths were used during Michael McNeil's assault on Kane's missile launch facility in Cairo, Egypt. McNeil discovered an abandoned GDI base nearby the facility, which had discarded but still functioning mammoth tanks. McNeil used these tanks to help him defeat Nod forces in the area. Outside this specific scenario, the Mark I's would be primarily used by the mutants known as the Forgotten. Making use of whatever equipment they could get their hands on, the Forgotten's arsenal contained a mix of both Brotherhood and GDI weapons. The Forgotten probably found some of these Mark I's at old abandoned GDI bases from the First Tib War. Another possibility is that GDI gave some of these Mark I's to the Forgotten. This would make sense as part of an arrangement GDI made with the mutants. In exchange for using their Ghost Stalkers as commandos, GDI gave the Forgotten some of their old and new weapon systems. There were two specific instances of the Forgotten using mammoth tanks during the Second Tiberium War, and the resulting Firestorm Crisis. The objective of Nod forces involved in these missions was exactly the same, destroy the Forgotten base, and retrieve the Tacitus. The first mission is non-canon, and specifically involved Brotherhood forces disguising themselves as GDI when attacking the mutants. The second one, which is canon, involved a Nod commander first locating the Forgotten base, then assaulting it head-on and retrieving the Tacitus. During both these missions, the Forgotten used mammoth tanks to unsuccessfully defend themselves from the Brotherhood. In the interim years between the Firestorm Crisis and Third Tiberium War, GDI made significant cuts to its military budget. Halting the spread of Tiberium became the new priority, and GDI hoped to preserve what few natural habitats of the Earth's environment still remained unscarred from the crystal's proliferation. This meant GDI had to phase out many of their advanced weapon systems, and in particular, almost their entire arsenal of mechanized walkers. This included the Mammoth Mark IIs, which were incredibly expensive to build and maintain. 
However, GDI still wanted a powerful vehicle in their arsenal to defend their territories, most of which were designated as Blue Zones. The vehicle also needed to be strong and durable enough to operate for extended periods of time in the harsh environments of Earth's Yellow and Red Zones. To that end, GDI turned back to the only other ground vehicle they knew of capable of fulfilling this role, the Mammoth Tank. The Mark I version wouldn't quite cut it this time, so they needed to design and build an upgraded version of the tank almost from the ground up. Once complete, this new tank would be known as the Mammoth Mark III. Armor Superiority. Compared to the Mark I, the Mark III's overall size was larger. This was due to the bigger guns, and perhaps an expanded number of crewmen as well. Just like the Mark I, the Mark III had four separate treads attached to the chassis. These treads were noticeably wider compared to the Mark I's. The two treads in the front were also slightly shorter compared to the back treads. The driver sat at the front. A viewing site, which had advanced optics installed, assisted the driver when operating the vehicle. A pair of headlights were also located at the lower sides of this optic site. On each side of the tank, between the treads, were two hatches, which the crew used to enter and exit the vehicle. As for the turret, its primary weapons were dual 150mm cannons. These guns were highly effective against any armored vehicles or structures. Each gun had what looks to be a laser designator, which allowed them to designate targets for their own gun crews, and perhaps other friendly vehicles. The turret also came equipped with dual 4 75-inch missile pods, designed to attack infantry or aircraft. This was actually less than the Mammoth Tusk missiles that were equipped on the Mark I. Still, these missiles seem to be more effective and reliable. When not in use, the missile pods are stored inside the turret itself, but most of the time, they are seen unfolded from it. Right below the missile pods are several cylindrical rods or containers, which I'm guessing holds some smoke grenades in order to lay down a smoke screen for the tank. The turret also came with a machine gun to engage infantry, which also seems to fold into the tank. A small hatch in the middle allowed the tank commander to get a view of his surroundings. On the back of the turret was a small radio antenna, and what looks to be some kind of small radar or proximity sensor device. It could also be some kind of robot that automatically operated the tank's missiles by locking onto enemy aircraft. Finally, the engine was once again placed at the back of the tank. As to the number of crew required to operate the Mark III, it seems to need the same number as the Mark I, perhaps one or two less if the vehicle uses automated systems. According to a description during the opening cinematic of GDI's campaign in Tiberium Wars, the Mark III apparently had an engineer crew that repairs the tank. This implies that these engineers are a separate group compared to the main crew, but this contradicts the tank's in-game functions, as unlike its predecessor, the Mark III does not repair itself when damaged. The only time the tank does repair itself is if it has reached heroic veteran status, as all units gain the ability to self-heal when they reach heroic veterancy. I think this inconsistency can be interpreted in one of two ways. The first is that in terms of the lore, the tank has a repair crew, but due to game balance, it does not self-repair unless it has reached heroic veterancy. This includes the tank's machine gun and possible smoke grenades, which are also not an in-game function of the vehicle. The second is that the developers change their minds and decide the tank would not have a repair crew in terms of Command & Conquer 3's lore and gameplay. However, this change did not occur until after they had already created this first cutscene for the GDI campaign. There's also the issue of this cutscene having the number 27 after the word Mammoth. Again, I think this was just part of the game's early development, as that number is not referenced anywhere else in regards to the tank. In addition, we know that this tank's final classification of Mark III comes from the Intelligence Database under the entry talking about the discontinuation of the Mark II Walker. Other than that, the Mark III Mammoth performed the same role as the Mark I. Another feat of the Mark III was that its sheer size allowed it to literally crush any smaller vehicle beneath its treads. One of the most important aspects of the Mark III was that it could be outfitted with other armaments. The most popular upgrade requested by GDI commanders was to replace the 150mm cannons with railguns. While it was expensive to install these railguns onto the tank, they substantially increased its firepower. 
the railguns could easily destroy most Nod vehicles and structures. And they were even effective against the Skren during their invasion of Earth near the end of the Third Tiberian War. The Steel Talons Experimental Combat Division were known for equipping their vehicles with additional weapon systems. Their Mammoth tanks, along with their Titan Mark II Walkers, were sometimes retrofitted with an adaptive armor system. When activated, this system reduced the tank's incoming damage and allowed it to resist DMP blasts for a short period of time. In exchange for this extra resistance, though, the Mammoth reduced its mobility and rate of fire. Additionally, railguns in the Steel Talon's arsenal were capable of being accelerated, which greatly increased their rate of fire, but at the cost of overheating the weapon and causing damage to whatever vehicle or structure it was mounted on. Resurrecting the Mammoth tank just wasn't enough for some within GDI's military administration, particularly those within the newly formed ZOCOM division, whose primary purpose was to operate within heavy, Tiberium-infested environments. Combining Tiberium harvesting with heavy armor and superior firepower, GDI created one of the most powerful vehicles of the Third Tiberium War, the Mammoth Armored Reclamation Vehicle. Marv assembly complete. Born from the same initiative that led to the creation of ZOCOM, the Mammoth Armored Reclamation Vehicle, or MARV, combines the near impregnable armor and massive firepower of GDI's most potent tank designs with a full-capacity Tiberium processing facility. Tasked with single-handedly abating Tiberium in red zones currently held by Nod or Mutant Separatist forces, the MARV was designed with battlefield flexibility in mind. With a powerful main gun, and four upgradable hardpoints, the vehicle can adapt to changing combat situations, take on any mix of enemy forces, and turn the tide of battle in a matter of minutes. The MARV is truly a force to be reckoned with. In many ways, the Marv is the next evolution of the Mammoth tank. For one, it's massive, making it the largest ground vehicle in GDI's arsenal, though perhaps not as large as the decommissioned Mark II Walker. The primary differences between the Marv and Mammoth Mark III are its main weapon and the built-in Tiberium refinery. The front or head portion of the vehicle is where the drivers were located. This was also where the Tiberium Reclamator scoops up and breaks down Tiberium as it was transported to the main body of the vehicle. Once the Tiberium reaches said main body, it was processed and stored in large modules attached to the back of it. Instead of having dual cannons or railguns, the Marv had a sonic megagun with three barrels. Each barrel was located with a single sonic shell, effective against infantry, ground vehicles, and structures. It could only fire one barrel at a time, so by the time the third barrel had fired its shell, the first barrel would be fully reloaded, or at least close to it, and ready to fire. Just like with the Mark III, the Marv could also crush vehicles beneath its treads, though this crush was even more effective, as it could be used against walkers like the Nod Avatar or Skrin Tripod. Another important aspect of the Marv was that infantry could garrison hard points located on each of the tank's four treads. In this manner, the Marv could obtain additional weapons or devices, dependent on the type of infantry garrisoned at these hard points. Rifleman infantry would equip the Marv with a machine gun turret, effective against enemy infantry. Rocket soldiers gave the vehicle rocket turrets, which are useful against ground vehicles and provided the tank anti-aircraft capabilities. Grenadiers equipped it with grenade launchers, good for clearing out garrisoned buildings. Snipers provided the Marv with long-range anti-infantry fire. Engineers gave it a repair node, which allowed them to make active repairs to the vehicle. Zone troopers outfitted the tank with railguns, further increasing its firepower. And finally, the Zone Raiders of ZOCOM equipped the tank with grenade launchers, ones that launched sonic grenades instead of the standard fragmentation grenades carried by grenadiers. The Marv initially took the Brotherhood of Nod by surprise when they first encountered it in Africa during the Third Tiberium War. Kane's abbess, Alexa Kovacs, ordered their AI Legion to use a Brotherhood force to destroy this Marv and capture the Reclamator hub from which it originated. 
Legion was able to achieve these objectives, and after capturing the hub, transmitted the Marv's designs to Brotherhood engineers, who were able to use the schematics to develop their own alternative. This alternative was not a tank, but a giant mechanical walker named the Redeemer. Zilcom forces attempted to push the Brotherhood out of this region by bringing in a couple more Marvs. But both were destroyed by Legion's forces, and the rest of Zocom's nearby bases were eventually brought to dust. With this victory, the Brotherhood maintained their foothold in Africa, and created their own superweapon to directly combat the Marv in future engagements. GDI would go on to ultimately win the Third Tiberium War by defeating the Brotherhood, at least most of it, reclaiming their Blue Zones, and destroying all but one of the Skrin's Threshold Towers. From destroying the Nod port at Alexandria, to assaulting Temple Prime at Sarajevo, even contributing to the Battle of Ground Zero, which saw the destruction of the Alien Control Node, bringing the entire Skrin invasion to an end. The Mammoth proved itself to be an integral vehicle in GDI's arsenal. I'd like to think that GDI would continue to make use of the Mammoth tank, or at least some version of it, in their arsenal for many years. But as many of us know by now, the last vestiges of the tank were last seen in a game whose reputation brought the Tiberium timeline to a sudden and disappointing end. There may never be a future for the mammoth tank of the Tiberium timeline, but its legacy continues to live on in other entries of the Command & Conquer series, such as the Apocalypse tanks of Red Alerts 2 and 3, in addition to the Overlord and upgraded Marauder tanks of Generals. Its legacy even continues in games outside the CNC series, such as the Harkonnen Devastator of Westwood's early Doom games, the Humans M850 Grizzly tank in Halo Wars, and even a cameo in the single player of Call of Duty Black Ops 2. I believe an additional homage to the tank can be seen in Fallout 4 as well. While it's true that a mammoth tank would not be practical in real life, I believe its legacy as one of the coolest, most powerful tanks in fiction will continue to live on for many years to come. Silence.